Okay, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Ricky Ricker. I'm going to be speaking on the OWASP Mobile Top 10 this afternoon. I'm going to start off by telling you a little bit about myself. I am a husband and father. This is my two daughters here. Um, nothing will make you want to get into information security more than having two daughters that like to get on the internet. <laughs> um, I, I never wanted to own a gun until I had daughters, and the first boy walked up to her and asked her um, out, and I never wanted to get into information security until my daughter started getting on Facebook. And I have been in technology for over 20 years, started when I was really young, and have progressed, but I am relatively new to this side of the field, the information security side. Uh, actually, a year ago today, I was sitting where you guys were at. I was sitting here at B-Sides Columbus, year one last year, sitting here listening to the talks and things like that. So it's a little bit surreal to be standing up here in front of you guys today. And this is actually my first conference talk ever. Hopefully not my last. <laughs> jump right in here. These are the OWASP Mobile Top 10 Risks. I'm going to go into them a little bit in more detail here, but as you can see, these are ranked in order of severity, in order of ease of use, in order of just how prevalent they are. So I'm going to jump right in here. For weak server-side controls, this is basically anything that a mobile application can do badly that doesn't involve the phone itself. This is everything that's in your traditional top 10 on OWASP. This is everything that's in the cloud top 10 on OWASP. So it begs the question, why is it here? Why, why is it on the mobile top 10? Well, the reality is, is that everybody that builds mobile applications focused on that stuff too, we wouldn't, we wouldn't need to be here, right? If everybody was as security focused as they should be and looking at these other areas, we wouldn't, there wouldn't be things like B-Sides Columbus or anything like that, right? There's a number of things that cause these kinds of things. It's a rush to market. You're rushing to try to get the application to market. It's a lack of knowledge based on the newness of a language, maybe, or a newness of a framework, or just unfamiliarity with the framework. It's easy access to frameworks that don't prioritize security. It's higher than average outsource development. Lower security budget for mobile applications. There's an assumption that the mobile OS takes full responsibility for security. And there's a weakness due to cross-platform develop and compilation. How do we prevent this? You need to satisfy the requirements of the OWASP Top 10 and OWASP Cloud Top 10 first. If we're securing on the server side, we've cut off half of the attack vectors. We need to implement secure coding practices across all of our organization. It doesn't matter if it's web, mobile, cloud, whatever. We need to be implementing secure coding practices across the board. And we don't need to, we need to stop being naive and think that holes in our web application or cloud services are just limited to those areas. They can affect everything because I can get to your website from my mobile device. I can get to cloud stuff from my mobile device. And those vulnerabilities affect me just as much on my phone or my tablet as they do on your laptop. Next up is insecure data storage. This, this is a big pet peeve of mine just in going through this because I see this a lot where my credentials and things like that are being stored on the phone. Anyone that has access to my physical device then has access to my credentials. Rule number one in this area needs to be 
never store credentials on the phone file system. Just, just don't do it. Don't store data on the phone unless it is absolutely necessary. As a developer, you have to assume that the minute that, that information touches the phone, it's compromised. You always have to assume, and you're, you'll hear me mention this a lot throughout this, you have to assume that whatever attack vector or attack surface you're looking at is already compromised. Because more than likely, it, are, it probably is. And if you assume that it's secure, that's where you're going to get burned. I'm going to mention a couple of best practices. I'm going to focus mostly on the best practices for iOS and Android because, let's be honest, those are the two biggest players in terms of the mobile space. I'm going to have a link at the end for some information if you do happen to work with Blackberries or Windows phones about where you can look at their secure best practices in terms of developing for those platforms. Um, for iOS, if you have to store information on the iOS, on the phone itself, use the iOS encryption library. There's common crypto amongst others that you can use. Consider using white box crypto cryptography solutions that avoid liquid leakage of binary signatures found within common encryption libraries. For Android, there's um, an Enterprise Android Device Administration API can be used to force encryption to local file stores using a command called set storage encryption. For SD card storage, you can be achieved with the javax.crypto library. You have a few options, but a simple but easy one is to encrypt any plain text data with a master, master password and AES-128. And I'll have a link again at the end. It's going to have all of these best practices from both OWASP and Android and iOS that you can look at. And there's some really good detail and really good information there that will be helpful in terms of developing your apps for those platforms. Skip on. So number three is the insufficient transport layer protection. This is basically anything that references the transport of information from the client to the server, whether over a no mobile network or a Wi-Fi network. This can be your lack of certificate inspection, we can't shape negotiation, confidential information leakage. Again, we have to assume that the network layer is not secure because you get on the wrong Wi-Fi network and information, confidential information goes across there, you're toast. You hook to the wrong thing, you're done. We need to apply SSL and TSL to transport channels that the mobile app will use to transport sensitive information, session tokens, or other sensitive data to a backend API or web service. We need to account for outside entities like third party analytic companies, social networks, etc., by using their SSL versions when an application runs a routine via the browser or WebKit. Avoid mixed SSL sessions as they may expose the user session ID. We need to use strong cipher suits with appropriate key links. We need to use certificates signed by a trusted provider. Don't sign your own certificates. Always require SSL chain verification. Only establish a secure connection after verifying the identity of the endpoint server using trusted certificates in the keychain. Always verify. End of the day, always verify. Always validate. 
when you have information flowing across, always validate. Do not send sensitive information over alternative methods. I had this recently where I got sent my password in plain text over a text message. Don't do that. That's because all it takes is someone, I, I, I can't count the number of times I have one or both of my daughters sitting beside me looking at what I'm doing on my phone. Now granted, if my daughter sees my password to my bank account, I'm not that worried. But if the wrong person is sitting over behind my shoulder and that text message pops up with my password on it, I'm, I'm going to be in a world of hurt. Use the secure channels that are provided to you within the platforms and within the networks. Don't try to go off the beaten path, as it were. Unintended data leakage. This relates to anything that happens in the operating system, framework, etc. that is happening without the developer's knowledge. The biggest thing here is I would recommend is threat model your operating system. Threat model your programming language. Threat model everything that you're using in this mobile application. Why? so that you know the weaknesses. You as the developer need to know the weaknesses in the platform that you're developing on. Because if you know the weaknesses, you can put in the mitigating controls to offset those weaknesses. And if you don't take the time to research, to really dig in to whether it's iOS, Android, whatever, if you don't take the time to really dig in and see how those frameworks and those operating systems and those programming languages handle, whether it's connections or data leakage or anything that you see up here, you're opening yourself up to having your application hacked, to having your user's data lost, you're opening yourself up to a lot of problems. And some of these things are just as simple as URL caching. You have keyboard press caching, copy and paste buffer caching, application background and logging, HTML5 data storage, browser cookie objects, and analytics data set to third parties. Know what it does by default. Know the defaults. Know the weaknesses. And put in the controls to help prevent that in your application. Number five here is poor authorization and authentication. I mean, this is basically the mishandling of anything that requires authorization or authentication in your app. This could be storing information on the client side, the phone, or not, or simply not requiring server side authentication. You need to reinforce your server side controls. If the app has offline usage requirements, implement local integrity checks. Again, you need to assume all client side authorization and authentication controls are exploitable or weak at best. We need to assume the worst when we're building these applications. Because any time that an application, whether it's a mobile application, a web application, gets targeted, 
it's always the same thing. There's a reason why the OWASP top 10 hasn't changed that much in years. It's because the same stuff is exploitable now that was exploitable then. This OWASP Mobile Top 10 hasn't changed that much in the few years that it's been out. Why? Because the same stuff is exploitable. If the same stuff is exploitable now that was exploitable then, you need to assume that when you're writing your applications. You need to assume that all of your connections all of your, all of the operating system, everything has weaknesses. That's why I, I'll go back to the point I made in the previous one. You need to threat model everything in terms of building your application. I can't say that enough. As I've researched this, as I've looked into this, that's the one common theme that I keep coming across is know the weaknesses and what the tools that you're using to build these applications. You need to know where the weak points are and put in the mitigating controls. <clears throat> I'm going to take a quick break and see if there's anybody that has any questions, comments. Everybody awake still at least? I haven't put you guys to sleep quite yet, have I? It's good. Plus, I'm going way too fast. I hit point fifteen, roughly 15 minutes into this talk. At this rate, we're going to have 30 minutes before the keynote session. <laughs> it's okay. Mine, I'm quick. Huh? It's okay. It happens. I'll try to slow it down a little bit. Not too much. Don't, don't want anybody nodding off. Number six is broken cryptography. This is insecure use of cryptography as having a flawed process behind the encryption that can be exploited or using a method of encryption decryption that is weak by default. I've heard this mentioned a couple times in a couple of the talks. Don't write your own cryptography. Just, just don't. I have never heard. Like I said, I came to B Sides Columbus a year ago. That was my first information security conference. This year, this marks the fifth information security conference I've attended in the last year. And I have never once heard anyone say, you know what a good idea is? Build your own cryptography. I've never once heard that as a good best practice whether it's mobile, web or, web, or anything else, don't build your own cryptography. There's strong cryptography methods out there that you can use within your application. You also want to be mindful of what operating system does. Now, iOS applications are protected in theory by default via code encryption. The iOS security model requires that apps be encrypted and signed by a trustworthy source in order to execute in non-jailbroken environments. It's the key term there, non-jailbroken environments. I don't know about you, but everybody, pretty much everybody I know that has an iPhone, it's jailbroken. <laughs> Upon startup, the iOS uploader will decrypt the app in memory and proceed to execute the code after a signature has been verified by iOS. This feature, in theory, prevents an attacker from conducting binary attacks against an iOS mobile app. There's some other freely available tools that you can use in the iOS environment, Clutch Mod or GBD, that will download the encrypted app onto their jailbroken device and take a snapshot of the decrypted app once the iOS loader loads. These tools are freely available out there for the attacker to use. So once the app's decrypted, they run one of these tools and now they have the decrypted app right there in front of them. 
Once the adversary takes a snapshot and short, stores it on the disk, the adversary can use tools like IDA Pro or Hopper to easily perform static dynamic analysis of the, analysis of the app and conduct future binary attacks. Bypassing built-in code encryption is trivial at best. Always assume that an adversary will be able to bypass any built-in code encryption offered by the underlying mobile OS. Also, there's going to be a slide here in a few. Um, option 10 is what's referred to as binary protections. There's going to be a little bit more information there in terms of how to prevent um, those types of attacks. best algorithms don't matter if you mishandle your keys. Many make the mistake of using the correct, correct encryption algorithm, but implementing their own protocol for employing it. Some of these are including the, same key, including the keys in the same attacker-readable directory as the encrypted content. Making the keys otherwise available to the attacker, you need to avoid the use of hard-coded keys within your binary. It's simple. Don't the first, the first one that it mentions there, including the keys in the same directory. Don't don't put the passwords in the same place that you put the data. You know, don't don't put a don't put a password protected file in a directory and then put a file next to it that says password. You know. Same principle here. Do not put the keys in the same attacker readable directory as the encrypted content. Don't use insecure or deprecated algorithms. There are some, and I'm going to name a few here, in fact, I have them up there, that are have significant weaknesses or are otherwise insufficient for mobile security requirements. You have RCA, RC2, MD4, MD5, and SH, SHA1. Do your research. See what the industry is saying in terms of best security encryption algorithms that are available. And use the ones that are the most secure, that are the most, that come the most recommended. I would say, because the people, there are people in this room that if they came to me and said, use this type, of, don't use this type of encryption, I would run away from it because I trust their understanding of things. By vice versa, if those same people came to me and said, come use, use this encryption, I would trust them. There are people in this industry that are experts on this for a reason. We should trust what the industry says and not use known, insufficient, or exploitable encryption libraries. Number seven here is client-side injection. This involves any input that comes in to the phone itself. Whereas before, talking with the server-side controls, you know, that's your, that's your cross-site scripting, your SQL injection. This is inputs that come in to your phone from untrusted, untrusted sources. And without input validation, there is no prevention, and no prevention against code injection. This can be related to data on the device itself, the mobile browser, application interfaces, or the binary code itself. You need to be understand all of the ways that your application can receive data. You need to look at how can my application receive information. And you need to understand those areas where it can receive data input from and put data validation in, in, into practice there. 
In certain cases, this is simple, but most of the time it's not. I mean, for iOS, for example, there's SQLite injection. SQLite can be exploited on iOS. You have to be sure that user supplied data is being passed to a parameterized query. This can be spotted by looking for the format specifier being used. In general, dangerous user supplied data will be inserted using a percent at as instead of a proper parameterized query specifier of question mark. You have a JavaScript injection. You need to ensure that your UI web view calls do not execute without proper input validation. Apply filters for dangerous JavaScript characters if possible, using a whitelist over a blacklist. For Android, SQL injection when dealing with dynamic queries or content providers, ensure you're using parameterized queries. It's the same principle as iOS. Same principle applies for JavaScript. Verify that JavaScript and plugin support is disabled for any web use, usually the default. Verify the file app application file system access is disabled for any web use. For your intent injection fuzzing, verify actions and data are validated via an intent filter for all activities. Again, it comes down to knowing what surfaces within your application can be attacked, what surfaces within your application can be exploited. And once you know those areas and once you know those weaknesses, it is up to you as the developer to put in the controls and put in the parameters that can prevent against those types of attacks. Security decisions via untrusted in inputs. This is related to the inner process communications within the operating system. This is how you pass information between applications. And you want to make sure that those inputs are handled in a secure method. For iOS, you want to use the open URL source application annotation method and validation argument against a white list of trusted applications. That way, not just any application can start talking to your application. Do not use iOS pasteboard for IPC communications as it is susceptible or susceptible to being set or read by all third-party apps on the device. For Android, by default, files that you create on internal storage are only accessible by your app. This production is implemented, implemented by Android and is sufficient in most applications. There's two types of um, parameters within Android. There's mode world writable and mode world readable. For IPC files, that do not provide the ability to limit data access to particular applications, nor do they provide any control on data format. You want to avoid using those at all costs. If you want to share your data with other app processes, you should might instead consider using a content provider. Content providers manage access to a structured set of data. They encapsulate the data and provide mechanisms for defining Data security. Content providers are the standard interface that connects data in one process with code running in another process, which offers read and write permission to other apps and can make dynamic permission grants on a case by case basis. To provide additional protection for sensitive data, you might choose to encrypt local files using a key that is not directly accessible in the application. 
For example, a key can be placed in the key store and protected with a user password that is not stored on the device. Well, it does not pr protect data from a root compromise that can monitor the user inputting password. It can provide protection for a lost device without violence and system encryption. Improper session handling. There's a number of ways that this presents itself in terms of Invalid, not invalidating sessions on the back end. You invalidate the session on the mobile device, but the session is still valid on the server. You don't have any timeout, or you have inadequate timeout protection. You don't rotate your cookies, and you have insecure token creation. First option, how to prevent is simple. When you invalidate the session on the mobile device, it gets invalidated on the server. It's that, it's that simple. Set good timeout protections with high security apps having the shortest window before timing out. I've seen this recently in an application that I have to use for work to punch in and out for the day. I have, I have an app on my phone that I have, to, I have to punch in and out using this application on my phone. This application has a timeout of two minutes. If I don't touch my screen or swipe my screen, the application dies and I have to log in from the beginning again, which is really frustrating when you're trying to pull up the application as you're trying to run in the door in the morning, you get distracted, and then you're punching in five minutes late because you have to wait for the application to reload and log in again. But it's good that there's timeout procedures implemented. If you have a high security app, don't leave it out there indefinitely. Put timeout functions in there. 15 minutes, 5 minutes. If it's a mid-range, okay. It doesn't, it's not a high security app, but it's a middle of the road security app. 30 minutes, 45 minutes. Low impact, give it an hour, hour and a half, whatever, whatever you feel is best in terms of the app and its functionality, but put the timeout parameters in there. If you don't reset the cookies during authentication state changes, it's going to create issues and it's going to create a hole. It's going to create a vulnerability. Authentication state changes are events like switching from an anonymous user to a logged in user, switching from a logged in user to a different logged in user, switching from a regular user to a privileged user, timeouts. Cookies need to be destroyed or reset, and cookies from prior sessions no longer need. Can, can, should no longer be accepted. Like cryptography, use well-established industry standard methods of creating tokens. Don't try to create your own. Don't try to go with what your buddy says, oh, I have this great token creation method. Don't do it. Use the industry standard. Don't deviate from what is defined and acceptable. All right, and the last one. is the lack of binary protections. This is primarily centered around a code base that is hosted in an untrusted environment. This is an environment where the organization doesn't have a physical control. Mobile clients, firmware and app appliances, cloud spaces or data centers in certain countries are, the exam are an example of an untrusted environment. First and foremost in this, you need to follow secure mobile coding techniques for mobile apps. This includes jailbreak detection control. Don't let your app run in a jailbroken environment. 
checksum controls, certificate pinning controls, debugger detection controls. Next, the application needs to be built in a manner that prevents an adversary from analyzing and reverse engineering the app using static or dynamic analysis techniques. Because if they can reverse engineer your app, they can create focused versions of it that can pull users, they can find weaknesses and exploit holes in your application. There, you need to, to be able to prevent an adversary from analyzing and reverse engineering your app. The mobile app must be able to detect a runtime at runtime that code has been added or changed from what it knows about its integrity at its compile time. That must be able to react appropriately at runtime to a code integrity violation. OWASP does have a project, it's the Reverse Engineering and Code Modification Prevention Project. It does have standards and practices for implementing this in your app and in your organization. I would highly recommend reading that and researching that. So kind of wrap everything up as far as so we continue to move towards more and more app mobile applications, and that's really where things are going. Everything is going mobile now, right? We need to, it's important for developers, for the QA, for support, for the security professionals to understand the weaknesses and the tools we use and put in mitigation strategies to account for these. Security has to be an end-to-end -end process. Security doesn't start with the security team. Security starts with your users. Security starts with your developers. Everyone has to have a stake in security in order for any of this to work. You can sit up there and you can put every top 10, you can put every strategy on there, but unless you have it bought in from top down and have strategies in place and people understand what their roles and responsibilities are, none of this is going to work. Always assume insecurity and work to address it. Never assume security is present for someone else's handling it. One of the first people that I got introduced to in the information security field introduced me to this idea of a uh, I don't even remember the term you used now. What was the term? I don't even know what you're talking about. Dead that. attacker. <laughs> you're, you don't view yourself as a pen tester. You, you're, no, I'm a composite attacker. Composite attacker. The bad guy in a controlled environment. Bad guy in a controlled environment. And that was mind-boggling to me the first time that I heard that. But the more that I thought about it, the more that it made sense. Because as much as we would like to think that the bad guys, you know, are limited to whatever our app is. The app, bad guys are thinking out here, just like Jason said in his talk this morning. The bad guys have a scope out here. Their scope isn't this small. They're out here. They're looking at every possible angle to get into your app, to get into your, to get your data, to break your app, to get, do malicious things with your app, with your website, whatever. They're not limited. So always assume insecurity and work to address it. Always try to think like the bad guy. You don't have to be a bad guy to think like the bad guy, okay? But always assume the worst and work to address it. I would rather put controls in that never get, never get tested, never get touched by an attacker than not do my due diligence and get popped because I missed something really simple. On that point, I mean, threat model, everything, look at everything from that perspective of the bad guy. Look for the threats, look for ways that it can be exploited. Think, think creatively about how an attacker could possibly get into your application and what they could possibly do with it.
Finally, never compromise security in a web application, a mobile app. Don't compromise it. You can find ways to make that app run just as fast with the right controls in place as you can without it. Don't compromise security for the sake of ease or simplicity or trying to rush it to market. Because the minute you start compromising security is the minute that you're going to get popped. It's just the nature, it's the nature of the business. Some links here. OWASP, I would highly recommend if you do anything in terms of developer or code or anything like that going on to their site. They have a number of things up here. Mobile security project, traditional top 10, the cloud project, the reverse engineering and code modification prevention project. Uh, Bill Simp gave a talk earlier if you happen to catch that. Um, I would highly recommend it. These are your links for Android, iOS, Microsoft, and BlackBerry in terms of the best practices in terms of software development from a security perspective. On that note, anybody? So your, your time clock app, are you trying to do the replay to make sure you're actually really timed out? <laughs> See a lot of mobile apps, they say you time out, but if you can capture your active session and just plug it back in again, you're back in again. It's true. <laughs> this is true. I actually, te I actually tested it, and theirs is actually really good. So for example, I log into my phone app, right? And I walk in the door and my buddy comes over and is asking me about the game or whatever, you know? And I, the two minutes expires. Not only does it time out my session, it completely closes the app out. So I can't. So do they remove all caching? That's the next thing. Yeah, that session somewhere. See, see, see. Now you're now, see now. Now I'm going to start digging into my. <laughs> might get into trouble. There's, there's the thinking like a bad guy. Yeah, that's what you have to do. See, I, I took it one step. He took it the next step. I didn't even think about the caching. <laughs> yes, sir. Your prior wraps have just a layperson here. Uh, how do you know that it's secure? I mean, just take, for example, some of the financial websites or even like password safe or something like that. How do you know? We're dependent on the developer to have done something, but how do we know? There are, we don't. Well, there are third parties that a lot of times help out the guy who a lot of social on the payments. Those are folks. If you feel able to do that work yourself, yeah, do it. Yeah. A lot of times, though, when I get a new app, I like to run it through a main middle and walk some traffic and see, looking for the secure. And then I'll dig into the phone, too, and see if it's story and the device. That remember me? Well, I don't know how to see that. Well, but, sure. Well, but I mean, there are websites you can go out there and, and People have done a lot of research on banking and credit cards. And oh, yeah. more than that. I think that it boils down to, you know, we don't know. So you've got people like us that start touching stuff, and we find out. Because you, you may say your app is one thing, but when, when malicious hands get on it, we find out that what you think or what you're telling you, your user base isn't true. So then that information slowly spreads. That's why you've got, you know, that's why user groups become so important. That's why the open source community of like Android, in my opinion, is so much better, even though that's a really loose term when you're talking <laughs> mobile space, but it's so much better than something like iOS because with everything being closed, we don't really get to dig into what's going on under the hood. I mean, we can still interrogate the hell out of the app, but that doesn't necessarily mean that we can see end to end what's happening. And, and honestly, when you're talking anything digital, that's the only way to know, to just do it yourself or to be able to, to aggregate uh, opinions of researchers that do the work 
and show the proof, show the data behind why we say that you can trust this, you can trust that, you can trust the other. For example, you, I'll give you, well, I wouldn't say that, <laughs> um, but, but, <laughs> but if my opinion matches his opinion and it's slightly off from his opinion, then you can, you can kind of glean, it's like watching the news, right? You can't believe what you see on the news, but if you pull bits and pieces be from all the different news sources, you slowly start to see the true posture of what's going on. And it's, it's the very same thing in, in the digital space. Is there is there anything in the P, in PCI compliance that uh, would that would address this through like don't don't people who are taking that kind of comparative businesses they have to disclose that information? I mean, is there because they have to do no. regular pen testing? I wish Jason was in here, because what you've done now with that question, you've taken our scope of the mobile space, right, and you've done this. Right, right. So when when we're talking processing cards, like you, we see that a lot. Has anybody been in the restaurants where you, you can swipe your card from a little tablet? Yep. Um, I give free pen tests to those all the time, because I'm not going to swipe the card. I don't trust that stuff. I want that. What's going on? You mean to tell me that's going wirelessly somewhere, and someone might not be able to find it? No. So, so if, if you're talking PCI, right, if you are interacting with that space, then you've got all those other controls that PCI covers to be able to protect you so it becomes platform agnostic. It doesn't matter if you're talking on a desktop or if you're talking uh, a, a mobile device. If it deals with something that PCI protects, um, then, then there should be, if they're PCI incorrectly, then there should be. That's a, that's well, a part of the PCI just became part of the with, with PCI, um, we don't have to disclose unless there is a breach. Uh, and it depends on the state, too. PCI doesn't cover that. A lot of times it's the state. I know California more parts, but then do they have to disclose in California? So certain states you have to, other states don't have to. So to answer the question, how do you know when you are not somebody who can read packets or has the minimum capabilities of hardware? You have, uh, you know, aggregate and enumerate all all the experts. You know, uh, Twitter it, uh, check their website. A lot of times they have a good faith statement uh, saying that you know we're going through these processes and doing our due diligence. You know, nobody's perfect, but we're doing these things. And, so, and then make a common sense decision based on them. And that applies to anything in the mobile space. I mean, if you're going to go and, and install an app on your phone, I tell people the same thing every time. Don't just don't just click install and OK and accept all those permissions. Pay attention to how many downloads are there. Has it been rated? Read the reviews because you start to see, you know, oh crap, this app totally horked my phone. You know, oh, maybe I shouldn't have downloaded it. It only has five downloads, and most of these reviews are written in Chinese. You know, that's probably a good indicator that that's not something I want sitting on my device, right? So it's, it's, it really is taking a step back from the instant gratification of, I want to use this password vault because I should be using a password vault, to now starting to research why am I choosing X over Y? And what is what are the people who can do the things that you may necessarily not be able to? What are they saying to to make me have that one fuzzy view? Well, and, and part of my thought, that, especially on the financial institution side, is they have an awful lot to learn, have to lose if they if there's any breach of security. Oh, yeah. Do they I mean, really? Aren't they sure? You know, Chase. Uh, uh, you know, but some of the yeah. financial houses, if they are messed up, you know that. that that's you would think, but not necessarily. It doesn't matter. They need governmental due diligence, and they mess up. It doesn't matter. If they met due diligence, and you and they're broke. It just doesn't matter. I mean, it's just like what we've seen. I mean, you you bring up a good point that yes, your their reputation is going to be more. So, I mean, financially. In terms of money lost, they're not going to be harmed. But you would think, reputation-wise, that they would be harmed. That would be a mark against them. That might prevent someone, you know, when they're looking for a new bank, of saying, "I'm not going to go to Chase or whatever it is that got popped." But look at the recent data breaches that we've had: Home Depot and Target, right? Yeah, but they're not losing business over this. I, I'm. 
Now, I'm, I'll be 100% honest, I don't shop at Home Depot to begin with. And Target, from now on, I've implemented the policy of I only pay cash there. Home Depot sales actually increase post breach. Right. Actually, Target, <laughs> Target here in Columbus, at least when I go to Columbus, uh, Maine, I know they've changed out all their. Uh, yeah, they've cards. changed all the readers out and everything. But here, here are metrics that are factual, though. I mean, after the Target breach, which you know was really the first of the mega breaches, right? There, uh, they saw a huge decrease immediately in sales. Right. The brand problem yes. was a problem. However, everybody else's publicist learned a lesson from that, like J.P. Morgan Chase, and they went with the "woe is me." We couldn't stop them. They're better than us. Yep. And people don't really care that. And there's so many of them in the in the media. And I forget what website it was on, but there's there's a great write up out there uh, that talks about how all these mega breaches after Target have actually not seen a decrease in. Uh, their customer base or name recognition. Yeah. Um, and yeah, there was the immediate thing to target. I mean, I, I know people personally that had their credit card information stolen and lost money because of the target breach. And you're right, they did immediately for the first two, three months, four months after the breach, they didn't go there. They refused to go there. But slowly but surely, you know, the public's memory is very short in, in these types of things, and they forget. And I mean, just like you brought up Chase, I had even forgotten that Chase had gotten popped. I had forgotten. Our memories are short when it comes to things like that. But he brings up a very good point. Everybody else saw what happened with Target and learned a lesson. On how to spend this in their advantage. Fortunately, the lesson wasn't secure your stuff. Right. right. Well, like with what you were saying, with uh, you know, the banks don't necessarily care because they're they've got some kind of protection. You look at J.P. Morgan as a use case, and they came up uh, initially saying, "Oh, what well, was us? We've lost X amount of dollars." And then when they realized that it was going to actually be covered and they weren't going to be buying necessarily a huge amount, their number grew exponentially. Oh, we lost this much money instead. You know, so you, you have to wonder if it's if it you know if it really was a benefit for them or not. Sure. So. And, and I mean, at the end of the day, you know, we have yes, in the security industry, we have to be responsible for what we can control. But there also needs to be an, an education, and there needs to be a fundamental change in how these organizations and corporations build their applications, build their websites, because yeah, they're they can spin it however they want, but at the end of the day, it's our information, it's our money that's at stake, and that should bother us a little bit. And we should we should have we should have a little bit pay a little bit more attention to things like that. So, anybody, anything else, sir? Um, this is addressed to the entire room. Uh, this is kind of like tangential to what you had up there regarding the encryption. Um, back in November with the ISC Squared meeting, it was brought up that the MD5 hash was was hacked, or it was cracked. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering if the MD5, I guess my, my interpretation is that isn't the MD5 hash part of uh, SHA-2, uh, which is uh, associated with AES? Is uh, and, uh, is 128 bit encryption considered uh, okay for mobile devices or POS systems? I actually have a note about AES 128 is, from my notations here, is what's the acceptable encryption for mobile. AES 128. That the research that I've done, the notations I have, AES 128 is the it's still the acceptable standard. There it is. <laughs> there it is. All right.